welcome everyone to the CDD Biotech webinar, where today we're comparing biotech companies and their informatics choices. We are joined by Foghorn Therapeutics Collective scientific team of uh, Dave Lahr, Joe Marciana, and Johannes Voigt, together with uh, N2H's Discoveries Jennifer Johnston. We will hear how biotechnology researchers best use the CDD Vault and the new ELN functionality integrated within the traditional activity registration, visualization, and inventory capabilities. In addition to standard drug discovery use cases, you'll learn about some sophisticated custom scripts uh, which interface with CDD Vault via the Application Programming Interface, API, witness successful creation of a useful data mart dubbed the Customized Fog Browser. CDD Vault plays well with an ecosystem of leading tools, including announced collaborations with other technologies that we, uh, that we stated in our ads leading up to the event today. I'm Frank Cole with uh, CDD, Collaborative Drug Discovery. CDD Vault is the platform produced by CDD. Let me now introduce the panel to you. Um, I'd like to introduce Jennifer Johnston, who is the CSO of EN2H Discovery, a biotech company focused on the modulation of the ubiquitin pathway for critical unmet medical needs in neurology and oncology. Uh, Dave Lahr is a director of bioinformatics at Foghorn Therapeutics, where he's responsible for bioinformatics enabling new target discovery and validation, as well as general research data management. We also have Johannes Voigt, who's the Director of Computational Chemistry at Foghorn, uh, where he's responsible for ligand and structure-based drug design, cheminformatics, and decision-enabling tools. And at some point, we're hoping Joe joins us. Joe Marciana is Director of Research Informatics at uh, Foghorn uh, Therapeutics. He's responsible for strategic implementation and management of research informatics. It's just part of the um, <clears throat> the world we live in that sometimes we just don't uh, get exactly what we want. So what I'd like to do is also ask everyone in the attending audience to please consider questions along the way and to pose them to us so that we can um, get the panelists to answer questions that are on your mind in the Zoom question and answer panel. So we're going to save them for later. <clears throat> All right, welcome everyone. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, before we move on, we want to invite you uh, attendees to, to make sure that you do do that. Uh, Jennifer, it'd be so kind to introduce yourself to our audience and start the, the discussion. That would be fantastic. Sure. <clears throat> so as Frank mentioned, I'm the CSO of A2H Discovery, which is a small startup company on the ubiquitin proteasome pathway. Prior to that, I was head of discovery research at Elan Pharmaceuticals, which was a neuroscience focused company. So um, my experience at Elan really <clears throat> led me to understand that I could start something that was reasonably virtual. And now today, when, when you hear more about what I'm doing, um, I'm really using CDD to help capture all of the virtual CROs and consultants that I work with um, into one coherent uh, company. And then, um, so let me ask the Foghorn team also to introduce themselves. Uh, Dave? Hi, um, I'm Dave Lahr, Director of Bioinformatics. Uh, we provide uh, next-gen sequence analysis for the company, as well as mining of publicly available next-gen sequence data sets and other big data sets that are relevant, such as the dependency map from the Broad uh, with cancer cell line viabilities and, and things like that. Hello, and this is Janis Voigt, uh, Director of Computational Chemistry here at Falcon. I've been with Falcon for about uh, half a year. Prior to this, I was at organizations like uh, Gilead, Sharing Plow, and Den Merck. As mentioned, I'm responsible here for uh, cheminformatics, and clearly, hypothesis generation usually starts with data analysis, hence CDD. And the in house integration we're talking about is, is quite important. But Besides from this, I'm also dealing with a lot of ligand and structure-based uh, design approaches. And now what Joe is unfortunately not yet dialed in. So he is leading um, our research informatics efforts here. Okay. So how did uh, Foghorn get founded? And then can you tell us a little bit about your chromatome regulatory system? Um, and how you're using that for drug discovery? Great, can we go to the next slide? So we're looking to, we're looking to pioneer a new class of genetically defined medicines. Um, the chromatin regulatory system at a high level is responsible for uh, 
what genes get expressed, when they get expressed, and the order, the relative order of genes that are expressed. Um, initial analysis of public data sets and other data sets has indicated that 25% of cancer tumors have a mutation in one or more of the components of this regulatory system. So it is potentially a, a, a broad class. There are a lot of opportunities here, we think. Um, and we're, we're trying to do that via our uh, gene traffic control platform, which lets us interrogate these systems and investigate their, their utility for therapeutics and um, development of small molecule therapies. Next slide. So to give a quick background, on the left, we have the uh, BAF complex. It's a fairly, it's one of the chromatin remodeling machines that are known out there in the literature. That's sort of our schematic. There isn't really a crystal structure for it. It's composed of many proteins uh, that come together. Each protein in itself can be rather large in this case, um, but that's just sort of our graphical representation of it that we'll use going forward. On the right, we've got a cartoon of the cell nucleus. And the main thing I want to point out is the DNA we have coming out of it. Now, at the, at the most uh, zoomed out level in the cell nucleus, you can see a tiny X that represents a chromosome. And then you see progressive layers of compression and compaction of the DNA. At the furthest outmost layer, you see the DNA is coiled around these things that I think look like Oreos. Uh, they're histone proteins, and that combination of the DNA coiled around the histone octamer is a chromatin unit, and that's what the chromatin regulatory system controls. It controls accessing the DNA at that level from the chromatin. Next slide. So here, here's another schematic of a typical normally functioning chromatin remodeling machine. It would it would, um, if things are working correctly, it'll be able to come in and identify the right location along the sequence where it can start unwrapping the DNA from the histone octamer to allow gene transcription. That's one sort of way the system works. Next slide. Another way the system works is transcription factors are also very important in this. And it's, it's, it's known scientifically, uh, publicly that the transcription factors now bind to both the chromatin remodeling complex and the gene that is being uh, transcribed or going to be transcribed rather. And uh, so there is an interaction in, in the past, the interaction between the transcription factor and DNA has been attempted to be targeted as a therapeutic. Uh, we think we'll be able to, or we hope to be able to target the interaction between the transcription factor and the chromatin remodeling uh, in order to provide more um, more targeted therapies. Next slide. To provide a sense of the opportunities here in the uh, sort of mutation landscape, uh, we've got this heat map where with on the vertical axis next to the BAF machine, we've got names of some of the genes that are part of the BAF machine. These are the subcomponents, the individual genes and proteins that go into make up the BAF complex. And on the horizontal axis, we've got different cancer types. And you can see we've highlighted some cases where there's an especially high rate of mutation overlap between a BAF component protein or gene and a, and a cancer type. And those are some of the areas we're starting to look into. Um, just to be clear, we're not going after mut mutation-specific treatments. We're really going after synthetic lethalities and other opportunities. Next slide. Um, and we've, we recognize that there, this is not just limited to cancer. There's a lot of literature out there about how chromatin dysregulation occurs in and may be responsible for diseases in other areas, such as neurology, immunology, virology. And we're actively starting to explore how we can start to uh, work on uh, develop therapies in those areas as well. Um, now, I think to your other question, Jennifer, um, about the sort of my experience, how is Foghorn different from other places I've worked? My past background was at the Broad Institute, which is more of an academic institution. So a lot of the differences I think can be attributed to academic versus industrial. But I do think, um, I really do think there is a unique character to Foghorn where everyone is um, uniquely focused on their projects in a way that is um, 
invigorating every day. Um, we have a wide diversity of talent, biologists, chemists, um, drug discovery people, all focused in coming together on a given project and bringing their diverse skills to, to move the project forward. And that's, that's really something great to see that I've, I've really enjoyed in my time at Foghorn that I haven't seen anywhere else. Um, can you, Jennifer, can you um, tell me how ANH is different from Elan for you? Sure. Um, so yeah, thanks for that introduction. And then just for the people who are listening, we're going to give you an introduction about what we're doing, and then we're going to go into how we integrate all that with CDD. So yeah, so as I mentioned, I'm at this small startup company, and previously I was at Elan. A couple of the projects that I'm working on were based on the experience that I gained at Elan. So, you know, but just to be clear, and um, first, Elan was exclusively neuroscience and focused on a wide variety of protein targets in that space using antibodies, peptides, small molecules, whatever you had to do to target that target. Um, and 2 h is focused on targets only in the ubiquitin proteasome pathway using small molecules, so chemistry, for oncology and neuroscience. And then again, you know, as you can see on the slide, I know it seems kind of trite, these mission statements, but really we are looking at first-in-class drugs um, with first-in-class targets. So we're going after E3 ubiquitin ligases, which, you know, really, as you know, um, Celgene has products on the market, but otherwise, really, no one has been able to drug those. And, you know, I've studied the proteasome pathway most of my career, and so um, just using that expertise, along with my experience at Elan doing small molecule drug discovery, to try and see if we can advance another target. And then again, um, just on this slide with the pie chart, um, the other important thing I learned at Elan is that if you go after a target that has very deep biology, highly va validated, for example, human genetic data, um, chances are once you are able to actually get a small molecule that impacts that, you'll have um, therapeutic relevance in the clinic. So, you know, we really do have deep biology and target validation as well as the small molecule drug discovery. And then again, just the final point here is that you've also got to have a strategy to get to the clinic. So nobody wants to take 5,000, you know, Alzheimer's or Parkinson's patients anymore. It's all about learning from what's been done in cancer to stratify patients into smaller groups. So, you know, we really have these three kind of arms that we do at AN2H. Novel targets, um, biology validation around the targets with small molecule drug discovery, and then having the clear um, patient strategy for getting to the clinic. And so, you know, how is this related to Elan again? I'm the co-founder of AN2H, but the idea really arose at the end of Elan when we were transitioning the research team out of there, um, where I got the crystal structure of a novel E3 ubiquitin ligase. And so the crystal structure told us there was a kind of an interesting chemistry approach we could take to activate what we learned was an auto-inhibited state, which is the majority of the time. Um, in, in intracellular stimuli then creates um, ligands, which will bind to the protein, allosterically modulated, to be activated. So that insight that we published in um, 2013 really formed the basis of the rational screen. And then after we did that screen and it actually worked, um, our lead compounds that we're now advancing. Great, that's awesome. So how do you use CDD with your teams to enable collaboration? Yeah, so maybe if we can just go to the, the slide with the CDD, um, where we have, you know, kind of all the interaction laid out there. Um, so we do um, three really big ways we use CDD. So first, um, as you can imagine, kind of the more routine, we have data entry and, and organization and access. So with the exception of the lab that I actually run in Ireland, where we collect and analyze uh, Parkinson's patient samples, as I mentioned, AN2H is run completely virtually. We have a variety of CROs all over the world. I have people in China, Ireland, France, Scotland, England, and then in the US, I have people in New Jersey, San Diego, New York City, Michigan, and Boston. Um, so CDD really allows me to control access to the database where I can have my specific CROs enter their data directly into the database. 
So for example, let's say we have a new um, SAR compounds that my chemist here in California has designed. People in China will make those compounds. Those people in China then can enter them, register them into the database. That then triggers shipment of compounds to our CRO in New Jersey to then run biochemical assays on the new compounds. That biochemical data then gets entered into the database and my MedChem consultants can go and log into the CDD and see what's going on with the SAR they designed from both the compounds that have been made and registered, as well as what's the data that's coming out in our biochemical assays. At the same time, the lab in Ireland can enter patient sample data as well as cellular assay data that we're using for compounds that have already been through our biochemical assays. So we kind of have it you know, rolling through with compounds, biochemical assays, those compounds then get shipped to Ireland. We do those in our patient assays, and then that gets added in, and we do our SAR cycles that way. The other big way that we use um, CDD, and it's really impacted everyone's kind of everyday life, is using the lab notebooks. So we use the CDD ELN for the official lab notebooks that we have. And, you know, we started out with another online lab notebook service but it was a bit time consuming and complicated, which means no one's entering their data into the notebooks. So since we've switched to CDD, all of our employees and consultants are up to date on the lab notebook. And it's a resource that I can routinely use when people are in Ireland and they're asleep <laughs> or China, and I wanna look at the data. So that's um, really been a fantastic transformation is to use the lab notebook function. And then again, as you can see from the slide, you can go back and forth in the search terms from the lab notebook to the, the total data database where we're keeping all of our compound registration and SAR information. So I think that also eliminates all this need for um, separate kind of silos keeping that data. So then finally, we also use CDD as a data room for our investors. So just like for the CROs, we can create an isolated space for the investors and diligence teams to access only the data we want them to see and we can organize it however we want. So you know, for us, having a one-stop shop for our data really saves a lot of time and energy as well as um, increasing compliance. Uh, moreover, it's completely searchable. And so I spend much less time trying to remember who, when, where was specific data generated and where am I gonna find it? So that's a little bit about how I use the CDD um, platform. For you guys at Foghorn, um, how does it help with your drug discovery efforts? I don't know, slide. Dave, if you wanna talk through that? Yes, yeah, I'll talk through that. Um, I think we have a slide for that, don't we? Do perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Jennifer. Um, it's pretty similar at a high level to what you described, although I don't think we're quite as extensive uh, with the with the usage in terms of the data room. That's kind of neat. Um, so our thing here, we have sort of made a an outline of a feedback loop we have, pretty basic to drug discovery everywhere. I think um, at the top we have, you know, basically it starts with. Uh, chemists reviewing the data that's been loaded into CDD and designing new molecules. Uh, these molecules get uh, synthesized and uh, then tested in biochemical and cellular assays. Uh, the synthesis and the testing happens both in-house and at CROs in a lot of different locations. And But all that data ends up um, in the uh, next step, that data ends up back in CDD. So again, as you mentioned, Jennifer, one central place for us to go to find that data. And then the cycle can start again with the chemist reviewing that new data and designing a new set of molecules. Now, an important part of this, uh, indicated by the green arrows off to the side, is we also use an ETL, uh, Extract Transform Load, to take data from the CDD API and load it into a data mart uh, Johannes has built in-house. This makes the data available to a lot of our other tools, uh, both ones that Johannes has built, as well as uh, other commercially available tools such as Vortex. Um, having it in these other tools lets us do a lot of analysis, uh, a lot of custom analysis that the scientists really like, and it lets them do it in the tools they're very familiar with. Uh, one example is uh, building SAR models, Another, another one that I've seen used a lot by biologists is checking biochemical versus cell-based assays to make sure the, to see if the correlations match, to see if we're doing the right assay to, to uh, advance through the process. 
Um, we are still exploring the best way how to inter integrate the bioinformatics work for the team that I lead, how that gets into CDD. I think one easy one, um, as, you've as Jennifer's described, is ELN entries, just getting an ELN entry in there to indicate every uh, next-gen sequencing experiment we've done. Getting um, the results of the bioinformatic or the the results of those analysis are fairly complicated and it's going to take some deep thinking by Joe and I and uh, the other members of the bioinformatics team to see how we can represent those in CDD, but I, I think there'll probably be some way that'll be meaningful. Great. So then how do your <clears throat> biochemists use the new CDD Vault ELN module? Well, it really runs the gamut. Um, I mean, it goes anywhere from scientists adding, uh, you know, experimental process and details uh, to just basically uh, them having it documented out in Word and uh, Excel documents and then uploading those straight to, uh, to the ELN. Um, what's nice is the flexibility of the ELN allows, you know, different degrees of, of, uh, of you know, details being documented, uh, you know, right on the ELN page. So um, for us, it kind of, um, allows us to kind of cater to all the different users and what they're comfortable with. And then obviously it, it allows you to do, you know, one-off experiments as well um, in terms of full documentation, you know, concepts and results, um, you know, with conclusions and everything else. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a nice uh, tool it kind of caters to everybody. Right. So, you know, for you guys, what's more important, uh, biological insight or experimental design or, how do each of those inform each other? Well, I mean, for us, I think there's not one that's particularly important uh, than the other. I mean, you know, for us, a great process involves, you know, getting, obviously getting a good feedback loop involved. Uh, so at Foghorn, we have, you know, a pretty diverse scientific group um, and making sure that we're running the right assays, you know, um, is, 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 you know, going to only going to happen if we have the right biological insight. And then obviously the experimental design kind of comes from getting the different feedback from all the different specialties and, and, and skill sets that we have at Foghorn. So, um, you know, for us, it's, it, you know, obviously all the different tools that CDD provides is, you know, helps us make those decisions and, and move forward. Yeah, Jennifer, uh, how does one opti optimally prioritize understanding uh, the mechanism of action with tool compounds versus the drug discovery activities in your organization? Well, for us, that was easy. So we have one series of compound that was very potent, but we could tell early on from the pharmacophore it wasn't going to be a drug. So what we did was we used that compound and we, you know, we made some SAR relatives just because we knew it was going to be a useful tool compound to give us a, a deeper understanding of how we were al allosterically modulating our target. So um, having that tool compound early on was critical to guiding us to, you know, a molecular mechanism of action for our lead compound. Even though we used a rational design, you know, you could imagine that maybe you got compounds that worked, but they weren't working through that mechanism. So we really were pressure testing our, our mechanism of action for our rational screen. And so, um, you know, it really helped us understand that, yes, the way we designed the screen was the molecules that we got out. And so what was really important was that CDD really eliminated, you know, what we had before CDD, which was this constant Excel spreadsheet updates. And, you know, you keep cellular data in an update and you keep, you know, one compound series in an Excel spreadsheet and you're constantly updating that. The problem is they end up being really large, they're unwieldy, they're numerous. When you update them, then they have a similar name and you can't keep track of which version. And so, you know, it's really just, it gets to a point once you've expanded your drug discovery and moved from kind of hit ID, um, it's really almost impossible possible to efficiently, you know, allow you to do drug discovery. So with us, with CDD, the tool compound data was able to easily be compared to our lead compound without, you know, hours of rejiggering spreadsheets as soon as we had a different thought about different um, characteristics we wanted to compare. So, you know, for us, that's kind of how CDD has helped us use our tool compounds more efficiently to inform our actual lead compound discovery. 
Great stuff, Jennifer. Um, I'm going to interrupt for just a second because we're going to actually poll the audience, give them a chance to uh, to uh, participate in a questionnaire that Charlie's going to put up on the screen for everyone. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. This is Charlie, and uh, thank you for coming. I wanted to uh, put this poll up uh, for the attendees. Uh, to ask what uh, do you all think is the biggest challenge to your data management uh, within your organizations. Um, so you can read the various options there. If you guys can uh, uh, do some voting, I see lots of people are making their selections. It's uh, interesting to watch the numbers zoom through. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much. I love the, the crowd participation here. Everyone woke up and uh, woke their keyboards up anyways. I know they've been awake. And all right, I think I will end this poll in a three, two, one. Thank you, everyone. I can share those results. So as you can see, creating an easily searchable central repository for all data um, got the most votes for uh, the biggest challenge. And I, I think um, uh, AN2H and Foghorn have uh, been talking a little bit about the use of CDD Vault in this area. I don't know if the panelists uh, wanted to make some comments here on this, um, uh, these results. I'll, I'll say a quick word that, you know, intrinsically, even though I don't, this speaks to the fact that like, even though I don't see an obvious path forward for loading the bioinformatics data into CDD. Having it live in another si system is just gonna cause a lot of headache in the long run and we really need to avoid that. And it's well worth the effort to put in, to figure out how to get it in there in a sensible way that's still searchable and, and allows people to find the data they need. To, have, to maintain that sort of one central location, the go-to location for data for Foghorn. Well, it's absolutely true for AN2H also, and that's why I've invested in a, you know, a consultant that I use that exclusively manages the CDD database just because, for example, if you have employee turnover or, you know, anything like that also, it's just a great way to have everything in one place where at least, you know, me and the other, you know, employees that have been around for four or five years can understand how it's organized and how to access data and explain it to new people who are coming in. So I think, you know, really for us is transform the organization. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, I, I mean, I think that it's, um, I'm not surprised by the results. I mean, we, that's one of the things that we're trying to uh, come up, I mean, uh, with is a, is a good strategy on how we're going to capture and, and analyze data that's even outside of CDD. And that's, Perfect. All right, guys, I will clear these uh, poll results and uh, you guys can move on with your agenda. Thank you. Thanks, Charlie. Sure. So I was going to ask Johannes, um, how do you use CDD Vault visualization module with the um, calculations, models, and API access for as a computational chemist? Yeah, Jennifer. Actually, most of our chemistry and biology colleagues see here at Falcon use CDD to quickly check if a data upload was successful and they look at assay data and in particular the dose response curve. I personally use mostly the CDD API to retrieve all Falcon data, uh, which is in CDD vault and regularly update the above mentioned local data mod. Local data mod is based on PostgreSQL with a bingo cartridge to allow substructure. Could we go to the next slide? Yeah. Uh, to allow substructure and related searches. I'm having a little technical difficulties myself here today. Just going to, there we go. Okay, perfect. <laughs> and related searches. And then this local data mod, as shown on this slide, which we now see, really allows us to uh, seamlessly integrate uh, local de decision support applications like Vortex from Dogmatics for table views, Pipeline Pilot in general, and then FOC browser, which, which is a homegrown interactive form-based view really with, with our CDD data. Furthermore, we built hookups uh, to ChemDraw. This is realized via Python ChemScript and Excel via a big uh, Excel add-in, which allows us to add the two-dimensional structures based on our foghorn identifiers. Uh, we can retrieve for one or multiple assays and for, for one or multiple 
readout types, uh, we can add this directly to uh, Excel or to, to Vortex. So we have a lot of customization in Vortex, which allows us to seamlessly interrogate and then update and then view data in Vortex, which, which comes originally from CDD. And then finally, we can use um, Pipeline Pilot and then Data Mart to, to generate the PowerPoint slides directly, which, which lists the SAR on the format. Usually people like to see it for uh, project review meetings and that really saves a lot of time that people don't need to copy and paste and copy and paste and make mistakes. So that was really providing a lot of um, uh, time savings. Yep, I have to say I use that. I use that also. It's a huge savings of time. So, so again, you know, what do you like about the API access to CDD Vault and how do you do regular versus unique calls? And how or does it actually generate more sophisticated insight? Well, as mentioned, the API really allows us to retrieve all of our chemistry data and all our SA data in real time from, from CDD. And then we can analyze it within CDD or also with the buff mentioned tools. So the CDD vault visualization module is great, but we often need specific customizations and more direct integration in integration and interrogation with our local tools, so such as mentioned Excel, Vortex, Fog Browser. And on that note, a few additional API features would be great, for instance, substructure search by API call, uh, querying protocol data not only by run dates, but also by the date the given run was loaded or last change, because sometimes data is loaded for a given run a couple of days after the run date, and then if you just use the run date as a query for what has changed in the last 24 or 48 hours, you would miss these. So then, yeah, you guys have a lot of unique kind of custom tools too. So how does CDD Vault interact with Fog Browser and Fog Slider? And then what's done or even defined synchronously versus asynchronously? So some calls are synchronous, for instance, in Vortex and then other tools where we translate our corporate identifier to the CDD molecule ID. And that in turn then allows us to point directly back into CDD to the page which lists all the details about the given molecule, the registration information, uh, the batch information, uh, all the protocols in which it was run, including the dose response curves. Um, another example is we retrieve results from safe searches also directly in Vortex. And that clearly is, is an asynchronous search because that takes quite a bit of time to, to retrieve it. And then for local database, data mass population, we naturally also use asynchronous API calls as this retrieves a large amount of data and that exceeds the, the 50 page limit, which, which is only allowable for synchronous API calls to, to the CDD API. Great. Jennifer, let me ask you a question. How do you balance the need for well-curated data versus the onus it puts on the scientist who's entering the data. For example, at Foghorn, on the informatics side, we try to avoid free text fields at all costs, instead using pick lists. But that increases the burden on the scientists who are loading the data. What tools would be most useful in reducing that burden, enabling the use of controlled vocabulary or ontologies throughout CDD? Well, yeah, so this we've taken an approach that I hope covers both sides. So. We absolutely put all data into the database using the ELN. So, but we also add in the curated data that makes it into the PowerPoint presentations, for example, for our group meetings or our external meetings and manuscripts. So, you know, so far it's been pretty easy, but it might be because we're still small. And I, you know, pretty much know what I'm looking for and who generated it roughly when they generated it. But I do agree with you that having more precision in searching is always better. And especially as you integrate between wanting to search, let's say a substructure search, to then search through all the documents that we've generated that involve using that substructure. I think that might you know, be a place where um, there could be some advancements to make it easier for the scientists, for example, to have all of you know, our compounds are AH, all of AH, you know, 251, I'm making that up, and then go be able to pull up all of the data from the lab notebooks and the presentations that have been generated with that, for example, with that molecule, that would be something that would be very helpful. Um, so, you know, so Dave, what are your key capabilities of the CDD Vault activity and registration molecule and module? And, and then why did you select it for Foghorn? Given that it sounds like with Johannes, you've got quite a bit of in-house kind of um, 
information technology uh, expertise. And then how did it compare with other systems you've used in your career? It's a great question. So we did have CDD a bit before Johannes. Uh, so uh, things might have gone differently otherwise. <laughs> but um, we, we uh, the CDD is strikingly similar to an NIH funded system I worked on previously. And so um, I was immediately biased towards it. I was immediately familiar with it. I worked on a system helping build a system called the Bioassay Research Database, or BARD for short. Um, I learned part of that similarity is by design that CDD had looked at BARD when they were doing, as they've done their development work. Um, from my perspective, CDD has made some great simplifications in the user interface, and it really improves the usability and user adoption. Um, I'd love to see the controlled vocabulary that I was talking about, in, in particular something like the BARD vocabulary or the bioassay uh, research ontology um, applied throughout CDD. I know that's been applied in the ELN, um, but for us on our side, uh, for our use, what we see is it would be great if it were part of, if there were one authoritative list of species or cell lines or protein targets, and then we could use those in the ELN or for the pick lists in uh, protocol conditions. Um, that would really be key for us. One of the, the key things I ran into as part of the BARD project, we were migrating data out of the PubChem system into controlled vocabulary. And there were a million different ways people had described a given cell line in PubChem. And that made it really hard to search PubChem. And so that's like the classic example, but it crops up all the time, things like that. And really trying to standardize on that is, is one of my, um, I don't know, that's one of my passions, I guess. Very good. You know, as you know, CD Vault is constantly evolving uh, to meet your needs. So uh, don't, don't stop asking for new things. Uh, let me ask, uh, take, a, take a, a quick chance here to ask a question uh, to all of you guys on your experiences and technologies that you use in-house. Of course, you've got a couple listed here in the ChemBio 360, but uh, technologies that you use in-house versus outsourced. Um, things that you do with your partners? How do you collaborate with partners? Um, what partners or type of partners do you collaborate with, collaborate with and why CROs and all that certainly makes sense. Uh, so if you could explain a little bit about that, that whole process, that'd be nice for the audience to hear. Sure, well, I can go first. I kind of, you know, in my introduction was describing how I use all of these different CROs all over the place. Um, we do have crystallography, um, computational chemistry, um, our patient samples and cell biology, we do that all in-house. And then everything else in the drug discovery pipeline is outsourced. And so while we prefer partners that can enter data into the CDD for us, as I mentioned, I also have a consultant that's completely focused on helping me keep CDD organized and up-to-date. And so, you know, since we're working on these first-in-class compounds for novel targets, my CROs tend to be very, very specialized groups. And so there's, there's not a lot of alternative option if they don't want to interface with the CDD. So I use my internal resources. So, you know, for me, I don't want to send the message that I have to have someone because the database is so complicated. It's really not. It's really having an internal person for me to help manage the CDD is more a factor of the different specialized CROs that I have mm -hmm. and helping them if, if they're small, for example, and they don't want to take the time to integrate into CDD, then I can use my internal resources. But in terms of being able to query the database or enter things into the database, it's so kind of straightforward, pragmatic, and really intuitive that even if you end up with a bunch of red exclamation points, it didn't work, they tell you why it didn't work, and you can simply walk back through each of the suggestions, fix those, and then the database is, you know, pretty smoothly integrated. So um, I can stop with that and maybe let Johannes talk about their, their use. Yeah, like, like many biotechs, we balance in-house and then outsource activities. For, in, for example, we have internal medicinal chemistry and labs, and of course also biology labs. And here we focus on critical and challenging chemistries. Uh, internally, while our CRO resources perform the more well-established synthetic tasks. And the same can be said for our biology. Our platform-related bioassays are, of course, developed in-house, but once validated and robust, we transfer to our CROs. And then with respect to our CROs and ourselves interacting with, with CDD, currently most of the data upload and data entry is still done in-house, but, but we are starting to have the internal discussion whether we might want to 
are some of the CROs which, which actually generate the data also to upload it directly in order to unburden our local scientists here at Forcom. And then final follow-up regarding the question why we chose a CDD and didn't build anything in house. So I think we like like everybody else, we believe there there needs to be a reasonable balance between buy versus build and whatever you can buy certainly has a significantly lower cost of ownership because you don't need to develop it, you don't need to maintain it. And with respect to CDD, in order to capture bioassay data and chemical registration data, I think it is now mature enough that it really has everything out of the box we, we need, so, so it would be foolish if we wanted to, to, to re-implement it. And then the aspects I mentioned with respect to ChemBio360, these were really just stringing commercial and then slightly customized things together so, so that everything can talk to, to everything. But, but certainly we realized that it makes a lot of sense to go for something out of the box, which has all we need, like, like CDD. Mm -hmm. Very good, very good. I'm looking at the clock and it seems like we're running out of time. I think we have a couple of questions. Charlie, uh, if we can go to the questions that came from the Zoom panel. Yeah, and if anyone uh, in the attendees uh, section have additional questions, please feel free to, to post them now. I'm actively monitoring these, uh, but we did have a, a few already. Um, so uh, one of our attendees has asked uh, a question directed at Foghorn. Uh, have you used um, data visualization and data modeling for PK data uh, specifically? I can talk to that initially, and then I think maybe Johannes can jump in and Joe can jump in um, just for historical reasons. Um, I did a big push uh, maybe about six months ago to work to find a way to get all of our PK, ADV, DMPK data loaded into CDD, at least in some form. Um, not necessarily at the level where we could really do um, you could use the, um, the basic uh, data visualization tool, but not necessarily displaying, um, you know, the, the PK plots and things like that, but at least to get the values in there. Again, going to the central repository, that took a good amount of work because even at that time, we had a, a relatively large number of these, pro these, essentially these protocols around. And now these protocols probably constitutively dominate the number of protocols we have in our CDD vault. Um, uh, not that their data dominates, certainly the biochemical assay data is the most numerous, but the number of protocols is, is quite a lot. Um, we're still working on refining that loading process. It's still a bit manual. It's, it's way more manual than the users would like. Um, it's probably more manual than I would personally like if I was responsible for loading it day to day. But um, I think we're getting there. Um, do you guys, Johannes or Joe, do you want to speak to that a little? Yeah, and then with respect to, to PK modeling, I mean, the really up initial simulation of PK modeling we, we are not really doing here. We mostly look at the PK data to see whether we have IV, IV um, correlation. So, for instance, we look at our microsome data or hepatocyte data. Is that predictive of uh, the, the clearance we see in the various species? Um, since now some of our projects are really starting to move closer to the clinic, certainly we, we will significantly more and more extend on, on these, these efforts. Perfect, great, thanks guys. And uh, I'll give Jennifer from uh, AN2H here a chance to weigh in, uh, both on the, the PK data visualization and modeling, if, if you have uh, thoughts there, but also um, a question that, that came up specifically during your uh, workflow presentation uh, was um, you showed a lot of um, workflow between the various entities and then consultants and CROs and your AN2H folks around the universe. Um, uh, how much automation are you worried about putting into that workflow um, versus um, really relying on, on the, uh, the people or the individuals? What, what were your uh, thoughts on, on automating the automation of that, that workflow between all of your moving pieces? Well, yeah, I mean, there, there's a, there's a lot of Skype usage at my company. And so, you know, it's all very heavily um, discussed um, routinely. And so, you know, I would say there's the only automation is in understanding the protocols, what are our cutoffs, what are the bookends for data that we would accept versus not accept. So we have a lot of discussion about that. So everyone kind of knows 
what are the parameters by which we view data as valuable? And so, you know, having that kind of understanding, discussing it, talking about it, you know, I, I can say that one of the most important things about having a very virtual organization is having good communication skills because it cannot run by itself. If you think that you're gonna allow this thing to run by itself and just set people up to just do their work and then enter it, it will fail. You have to put in a lot of work to discuss it, data comes back and it doesn't make sense all the time. So, you know, I know we're kind of giving you the, the Julia Childs, here's the cake out of the oven kind of picture today, but really this is a lot of time, a lot of effort. I spend a lot of time looking at the data from all the different aspects from, you know, the compounds that we're making all the way through to the PK tools that we were just talking about talking to each of these CROs all the time, making sure we're monitoring the data before it gets entered into the CVD. So the only thing that's automated in my workflow is the SAR for the chemistry, because really that's reasonably um, reproducible. Our assays are dialed down. We've done those a lot of times. We can synthesize the compounds, register those, test them in the biochemical assays. That's pretty automated. But once things come out of that funnel, we have to decide, okay, are these compounds we really want to send to the cellular assays? And from there on, there's a lot of discussion about everything. So for us, that we only automate, automate the front end. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, Foghorn, any thoughts on automation from your side or? Yeah, we have, a, we have a little bit that I've worked on um, in terms of, it's very simple and I inherited the code from a, a predecessor who was a consultant um, who was managing CDD prior to me joining Foghorn about a year ago. Um, and the, the basic premise is that we're, the automation allows transformation of data that's output from an Envision instrument and gives a relatively simple form for uh, scientists to annotate in what well, what compound was used and what the dose was used. And it tries to do that by, you know, giving the, the scientist just enters uh, a compound and the starting dose and the fold dilution. And then the system will sort of automate transforming that into a CSV file they can then load into CDD. Um, in terms of other automations, uh, I also built a system to help us sync up a our chemistry ELN is actually a different product, uh, and I've built a tool to help keep synced the, to copy the registration from that tool using its API into CDD using the CDD API. It's not the most fun tool to use, as Joe will attest, um, having suffered using it after I wrote it, uh, but uh, it, it, it has managed to keep us going and allow us to uh, use that tool that the chemist wanted. Um, Joanna and Joe, do you want to speak to this? Yeah, I mean, I think what's important is that, you know, when you start automation, uh, or at least, you know, implement any automation, I mean, you really need a, a pretty consistent workflow and, you know, Dave's uh, implementation, you know, in terms of the ETL from our uh, chemical registration into, into CDD works great. Um, I mean, it's you know, he, I think, uh, is probably a little more critical of his own stuff than, than I would be, but, uh, you know, it works great and, and, you know, allows us, you know, to pretty much stay hands off, um, you know, in terms of, of doing all that data transfer. Uh, so it's, you know, I, I think that the tools, um, that CDD provides pretty good uh, in terms of the API, you know, Johanna spoke a lot to that. Um, and, and we've had some fairly good, uh, you know, success implementing automation with it. Yep. And, you know, if I can just make a comment about that, I think one thing that I would do differently is that if we're developing a new assay, I would just force people right away to start putting it in in an automated fashion. And that's why we don't have a lot of automation around our cellular assays, because we're using high content microscope screening assays and all that and people have developed their own kind of analysis tools and their own way of collecting the data. And so if I was doing it again, I really would start fresh and just have all that data, 96 well plates and all that go right into the CDD because there are a lot of fantastic automation tools that I'm not accessing yet. And it's really just because people already got a little bit into a rut about how they were doing things, so. Totally agree. It's great if you can get in early and 
at the outset of a collaboration help define the data transfer formats. It's, it's going to be really mundane to a lot of people, but man, it can really, really speed things up. Absolutely. Yeah. Do it fast, do it early. <laughs> <laughs> I like that motto. Thanks everyone. So um, I think I'm going to have two more questions here. Um, and this one is uh, um, a question on the um, kind of format of the data. Um, sometimes we refer to this as um, different religions in CDD vault, and we're not really supposed to talk about religion, I guess. But um, you know, with the flexibility of, of of storing the data in CDD vault, you, you have some choices, you have some options um, in how you want to uh, store the data and, and visualize and view the data and interact with the data. And so we do have a question from an attendee that that's that's asking, are you uh, are you storing your data more in kind of this wide um, many columns type format? Are you going into a, a tall and skinny format, uh, maybe using something like the protocol conditions feature that's available in your protocol definitions within CDD Vault? Uh, do you have any guidance on someone who, who might be um, at the point where they, they are now making a decision on, on how to go uh, with this? Because, you know, you, you really can um, do it in, in multiple ways here. Um, so I guess that's the question. Yeah, let yeah. me speak to this. I would certainly suggest to first go by tall and skinny with as many protocol conditions as is sensible. So you minimize the number of unnecessary protocols and just condense it. But then clearly once you want to communicate and uh, deploy the results to your end users, you clearly then need to, to pivot it and then convert it into a, a large and then white table. And that's, that's for instance, part of the processes we've, we've outsourced from CDD and that's put into the data mart so we can summarize for a given project at the um, summary average level, all the assays uh, users are interested in. But originally the, the base data storage clearly needs to be uh, tall and skinny to really allow all the flexibility of dynamic uh, conditions and, and readouts. Yeah, I'll, I'll echo that. I'm a strong, I'm strongly in the tall skinny camp and I've, I've been, you know, driving that in, in our CDD vault as much as I can. Um, I think one of the, one of the features in CDD um, directly, the, the idea that the results will be aggregated based on protocol conditions gives us an initial, an initial quick view of that pivoting, although there's much more sophisticated stuff that can be done in the data mart. Um, that Johannes has built. Um, but I, I think there's even an upcoming feature that you guys are going to release soon that sort of gives us a better view into those, for each of those aggregations that CDD has done, what are the list of protocol conditions, which may not matter to a lot of people, but for us, we have protocols with three, four protocol conditions, and those get jammed up there and lost, and it'll be really nice to have that feature where we can just have that readout of exactly what we're looking at in each column. I think the other thing with the tall, penny, the tall skinny pivot is a lot of these assays, people are gonna, once we have it in that, we have it in that tall skinny format and we then have, because we're using a protocol condition, we then automatically have that search, that search control available right at the top. Um, I find that super useful. I've had, I've had our users say that's really great to be able to go in and say, oh, I, want, I just wanna look at the data for this target protein. And they can just jump right to that. Excellent. Thank you guys so much. All right. I think for our last question um, of the day, uh, I, we have a question here uh, on the uh, data privacy and security um, uh, within CDD Vault. So, you know, I can certainly answer um, the technical questions and talk about how our, you know, security officer ensures that CDD Vault is using the most sophisticated uh, security technologies and layers to to create these uh, wonderful defenses for our CDD Vault servers, and the you know being FISMA compliant and and um, having second factor authentication and a variety of user roles to really help uh, make sure that um, only the users you want to be doing things within your vault are able to do those specific things. Um, and we have all that nailed out. But really, I think at some point, as customers, you guys had to decide on you know, the privacy and security of your data going into CDD Vault. So maybe the better way to answer that is, what was your perspective when you were going through that or, or how do you feel about um, uh, the security and, and, and uh, privacy 
uh, of having a web hosted uh, type platform for your data management. Oh, sure. I mean, I'm happy to speak to it first. I certainly had a reasonable amount of pushback from within my organization as far as, you know, CROs in, all over the world, you know, being able to access this. And, you know, I really just felt that the ability to increase our, you know, workflow without demand on our internal group, which was very small, was going to outweigh any worry that we had about security. And, you know, I think our experience has been, you know, through interacting with people, talking to them as they enter data, that it really has been great that there's a narrow alley that they can access and that's what they can do. And again, that's why I've expanded it into my lab notebook. And then now we do all of our data room there because we've just seen through our experience that, you know, if you're worried about, you know, some CRO being able to access your whole database, we have not found that to be the case. So, you know, that as far as I'm concerned, I, I really kind of have left all those, you know, a couple of years ago. I don't have that concern at all. Yeah, I can speak to, I can take an initial stab for Foghorn people. Um, the, my take on it is that you guys are going to do way better at security than any of us are. Um, we don't have any expertise in that area and that's sort of a, you know, we've yeah we've done do what i hope is due diligence you know like as you said talking to charlie about the security measures that are in place the adding two-factor authentication when the time comes um but again i think and this is also a case for you know outsourcing a lot of software in general is you know you guys we're not security experts and at a company our size it doesn't make sense for us to hire a full-time security engineer to sort of ensure that that security that we you know to build systems and build all these security things we it's much better for us to let you guys have that security engineer be working on that for a whole range of people and ensuring all of us are secure that just is a better model in my mind thanks guys i'm going to start to wrap up here but i will say that i wanted to make sure that Char everyone knows that charlie is the director of customer engagement has been with us for quite some time so he's had he's heard all the questions and all the all the concerns on security and all kinds of other things including the the uh, functionality enhancements that we constantly make so thank you for all of that uh, I also will say due diligence is an up and coming thing. And Jennifer, we, we're, we're seeing more and more people use it, uh, use CD Vault for that very reason. So it's kind of interesting. That's uh, kind of takes it away from the, the deal room uh, software that's out there. And we've got, you know, you've got your data in there ready to share with your um, your partners or someone who's looking to acquire a piece of your uh, your business. Um, so it's a great way to do this. So I want to thank you all, uh, Jennifer, David, uh, Johannes, and Joe, uh, for for your your contributions today. Uh, and, and discussing these uh, these great uh, these great things that you're doing with uh, with CD Vault and, and the science that you're that you're sharing with us today is, is awesome. So again, thanks again for your participation, and I want to also thanks thank the attendees for being here today and for their questions. And uh, just want to invite anyone to please look on our website for future events, whether it's a conference or an upcoming webinar at collaborativedrug.com, and uh, hopefully you you'll learn something uh, as you continue uh, working with us. Uh, through the months and years. So thanks again, everyone, and uh, everyone have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks all. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye.